All right, ladies and gentlemen, three o'clock. Welcome back to your favorite class. Rawr! <laughs> okay, announcements for the class. Announcement number one. Homework number three is due next week, Tuesday. It is on kin kinetics, which is what we're studying this week. And there is one problem on three-dimensional kinematics using helicopter. So hope you like that problem. I think it's kind of a cool problem. So take a look at that three-dimensional kinematics. Uh, remember, I'm not going to ask you anything about three-dimensional kinematics on any tests. I just want to make sure you can kind of do it. And uh, so go through that exercise and, and hopefully enjoy that. Announcement numero dos. And that is that I have posted the first simulation by Caleb's request uh, now to Blackboard. All right, so make sure you take a look at that. It will be on two-dimensional kinematics. So everything uh, that is in that simulation assignment is based on material that you did for exam number one. So you should be able to do the simulation right now if you want to, okay? So please go check that out. Uh, you're doing analysis, velocity analysis only on sort of a mechanism, uh, you can go take a look. It's a little bit tricky. I would suggest kind of getting in on it earlier rather than later. And again, if you have questions, come to office hours and I'll help you work it out, okay? Uh, Caleb says, let's go. I know what I'm doing this weekend. Exciting weekend, Caleb's got planned. Yes, no Easter dinner for me, only simulation. That's my dinner, Rawr. Okay, so take a look at that simulation. Uh, last thing I'll say is reminder that this Friday, Jesus can wait. Oh boy, I'm not going to touch that one. Okay, Last, this Friday, university holiday, so we don't have any formal lecture. However, I will be doing practice kinetics problems during your regularly scheduled lecture period. Okay, if you can come and you want to check it out, great. If not, don't feel obligated. Um, I'll still post uh, the whatever I do to YouTube if you want to sort of check that out and take a look. So, university holiday. You don't have to come to class. I'm going to be doing practice problems if you want to see them. Otherwise, that's fine. If you don't want to come, no big deal. All right. So uh, if there are no further questions, I see some jokers in the comments there. Uh, if there are no further questions, we'll just go ahead and sort of refresh where we were last time and dive in on some uh, new material, sort of rounding out our discussion on the derivation of kinetics equations. All right. So no questions, no questions. Sweet. Making my life easy. Now, today, we continue our discussion on rigid body kinetics. What day is it? Uh, day number 14 million in quarantine. Uh, this is lecture from 4 8. Bam. All right. So, I hope you brought your math pants today. You got your math pants on today because today will be a very mathy day. We're gonna, frankly, I hope you have pants on at all, okay, because we're all inside. But there's gonna be cross products, there's gonna be derivatives, there's gonna be integrals. It's gonna be crazy. But when all the dust settles, we'll be left with a very simplistic equation that we're gonna use for our kinetics analysis. So buckle up, you friends, and let's get on with it. All right, so review. Let's talk about the things that we discussed last time. We are looking for an angular analogy to what is our F equals MA equation. So we're looking for angular analogy of some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Now remember, we had gone through some rigmarole to show that we had an alternate form of this particular equation. So the alternate form was that the sum of the forces is dmv dt, where we assigned this sort of mv vector as L, which is the linear momentum vector. And so this is dL dt, or what we saw is the sum of the forces is the time derivative of L, which is L dot. All right. So this is sort of a simplified version of, or what we'll say is the linear momentum version of Newton's second law.
Okay. Some of you have seen this before. Maybe some of you haven't. Now you have. All right. So linear momentum form of Newton's second law. And we're looking for the angular analogy of this. So before we sort of dive in on the angular analogy of this, we have to introduce the idea not of linear momentum, but of angular momentum. So we needed a equation for the angular momentum of a rigid body. So if we're going to do this time derivative analogy, we need to have uh, an expression for the angular momentum of a rigid body. All right. Otherwise, what are we taking the time derivative of? OK, so we needed an angular momentum for a rigid body so we can take the time derivative. And so we said that that was this capital H G. Which we sort of had a couple definitions for this, but sort of the definitions that we'll use today in our derivation. This is the integral on the mass of all of the contributions of the angular momenta of all of the individual particles on that rigid body. So we wrote this as the integral of all of the individual differential components of the angular momenta on the rigid body. Which we went through a derivation to sort of show that this was equal to the mass moment of inertia of the rigid body multiplied by the angular velocity of that rigid body. OK, so this here was the angular momentum of our rigid body about the center of gravity G. This is RB, not to be confused with my favorite fast food restaurant. Just kidding, it's not my favorite fast food restaurant. Angular momentum of rigid body about its center of mass at point G. All right, center of mass, center of gravity. Technically, they're not the same things, but as far as this class goes, we're going to, we'll just call it our center of mass. We're on Earth for this whole class. Let's just say that. All right. So the angular momentum of the rigid body about its center of mass G was given by this general expression. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to take the time derivative of this expression and see what sort of shakes out from the math after we've done playing our tricks. You know, tricks are for kids or for adults that are doing complicated engineering mathematics. All right. So tricks no longer just for kids. Tricks are also for grown-ups. All right. So now. Today. We look at. What is the time derivative of this vector hg as our angular analogy. What is the angular analogy of this linear momentum, the LDT, which we know is the sum of the forces. All right, so let's buckle up, friends. It's time to derive. And make sure you don't drink and derive. All right. <laughs> oh, man, my, my comedic genius will just not be appreciated. OK, in, in its time. All right. Don't drink and derive. All right. So today we look at this particular derivative. So let's get on with it. All right. So remember, we sort of had two definitions of our angular momentum. So we had two expressions. Boy, that's terrible. S I O N S two expressions for uh, this angular momentum of a rigid body about its mass center. One of them was it's the summation or the integral on the mass of all of the differential elements of all the individual pieces on that body. OK, so that's one particular definition that we had where. Remember, DH is. The position vector crossed with the differential mass at that point multiplied by the velocity at that point. So this is like R cross DL or R cross DMV. Hopefully you don't have to go to the DMV anytime soon. It's not a place I would like to go in any time in the near future. All right. Also, we had the second definition, which after we went through our whole rigmarole, we showed that this was just simply equal to IG omega which is a much more simplistic definition where omega is something like r cross v, right? Or r cross um, 
omega cross r. Omega is a relationship of the velocity and the position. All right, so these are our sort of two definitions. All right. So these two guys, we're going to equate and take the time derivative. So that is d dt. Then we're going to play some tricks and see what happens. All right. As all, you know, mathematicians do. All right. How are we doing today? Uh, D U I D T. <laughs> uh, that's a good one, Alec. I like that. D U I D T. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. All right. So let's get to it. So execute. All right. So I'm going to sort of put this in the middle of the paper, and then we're going to work our way down both sides with some simplification. All right. So left hand side, we'll have the time derivative. of what is this integral on the mass of this differential angular momenta, all right? So this is going to be equal to the time derivative of sort of what we derived before of, here this is, ig omega. All right. Let's go, baby. So a couple things that we can sort of do straight away is that we know that this dh can be written as r cross dmv. So we'll sort of simplify uh, the left-hand side here in that dh is r cross dmv. So let's sort of expand the left-hand side here. This will turn into d dt of the integral on the mass of R cross dmv. And we're not going to touch the right hand side quite yet. We're still going to leave it. Don't worry, we'll be simplifying that right hand side pretty soon with some of our tricks. Tricks no longer just for kids, also for grown ups. All right, so we've got this cross product here and we've got this time derivative. So what you'll notice here, or what maybe should be noticed, is that this is an integral on the mass um, with no time dependence. Okay, so what that means is that we're free to move the time derivative inside the integral if we want to. So we can take this time derivative and move it inside the integral because the time dependence of this derivative is not related in any way to the integral on the mass. We're going to assume that this object is not changing mass with time. So any time uh, dependence of the mass is not important. Okay, so we can pull this derivative in and we can rewrite by pulling that time derivative in. All right, so we're going to be left with the integral on the mass of this time derivative d dt of this entire thing on the inside, which is r cross dmv. All right, and this is all now equal to, again, the time derivative on the right-hand side, which we have not yet touched. All right, still ig omega. All right, now we're ready for bringing our time derivative into this cross product. So we're now going to distribute this guy to the cross product. And the way that we do that is using the product rule for cross products, which looks a lot like the product rule for um, traditional multiplication. So I'll write here that we're going to use product rule for derivatives. And this will apply to both the cross product on the left hand side and the multiplication on the right hand side. So we're going to distribute in here and we're also going to distribute in here. So away we go. The integral on the mass of, if we're going to distribute this, we do the derivative of the first cross with the second plus 
the first cross with the derivative of the second. So this will be the derivative of the first, dr dt crossed with the second, which is dmv, plus the first crossed with the derivative of the second. Uh, sorry. This is d dt of dmv. This will be equal to, I'm going to enact the product rule on the right-hand side now, so a very similar idea. The first term, ig, times the derivative of the second, plus uh, the derivative of the first times the second. So this is d ig dt times omega. All right. God damn, complicated. We got integrals, we got cross products, we got time derivatives, we got all sorts of stuff going on here. This is freaking complicated. All right, I told you, better be wearing your bath pants. All right, better be wearing any pants at all. Now, this looks rather daunting. All right, we've got a mass integral of all of this stuff, right? So notice that this is all sort of contained inside the integral, all right? All of this stuff is still part of the integral, all right? So we got a really complicated left-hand side. So why don't we start with the right-hand side because that looks a lot more friendly. So let's start with the right-hand side and let's look at what some of these terms actually are. All right, well, IG, that's, we're gonna start over here with this term. Well, IG, that's pretty obvious. That's the mass moment of inertia of the object about its center of gravity. These are well-established um, values. So it's just a constant value. And D omega DT, that should be easily identified as alpha. Right, so the derivative of the angular velocity with respect to time is alpha. All right, so this term here will just become ig alpha. Okay, well, that was easy. All right, so easy a caveman could do it. All right, now let's look at this term. Here we have the time derivative of the mass moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity vector. All right, the time derivative of the mass moment of inertia. Well, again, we're going to assume that our rigid body doesn't accumulate or lose any mass over time. It stays coherent. It doesn't distort. And so we'll assume in this class that the mass moment of inertia of an object does not change over time. It is what it is. So we're not losing any mass. We're not changing size in any way. It's rigid. So this guy here goes to zero because IG is constant. Okay, it does not depend on time. So the right hand side is easy. All right, it's just IG alpha on the right hand side. Sweet. Now let's go to the left hand side. A mm, little more scary, a little more complicated, but we can do it. DRDT derivative with respect to time of the position vector. Okay, well, this is just the velocity. All right, the derivative of the position vector is the velocity. So this guy here is like V cross DMV. So the vector crossed with itself will be zero. Okay, if we remember back to some of the basics of cross products, any vector crossed with itself is going to be equal to zero. And so, yeah, we got this dm term that's sort of hanging out, but it doesn't matter what the value of dm is um, because any vector crossed with itself multiplied by any constant is still going to be zero. And so this guy here is zero. All right, so that's useful. All right, we can sort of get rid of that guy straight away, which is nice. So all we're really left with is this term here, which is a little bit complicated and we're going to have to talk about just a little bit. All right, so let's have a little aside for this term. And let's look at this term. This term is the integral on the mass of R cross the time derivative of dmv. All right, this is this particular term. We can sort of make a little note about this particular guy and note that we know that this here, dm times v, is a differential of the linear momentum. Remember, the velocity times the mass is the linear momentum. All right, so this then could be equal to the integral on the mass of the position vector crossed with the time derivative of what is dl. 
right? Well, we know that this is, I'll change color here. This is like DL dot, which is DF, okay? This is F equals MA or F equals DL DT, right? So this is a differential force DF. All right, then this is the integral on the mass of R cross DF. All right, well, the integral on the mass of the contributions of R cross any differential forces acting at partic any particular point, this is the summation of the moments on the object. So after executing this integral, this is just the summation of the moments on the object. All right, this is R cross F in sort of its differential form. So we're adding up all the forces on the body, crossing with the position where they act. This will give us the moments acting across the entire body. And if we integrate over that entire body, then we're left with the moments on the body. All right, so that term here just ends up becoming some of the moments. All right, so let's put it all together. Let's do the hokey pokey, turn ourselves around. All we're left with here is this term's gone, this term's gone, and we're just left with what is this expression here. Some of the moments is IG alpha. So in closing, after all that, we get that the derivative of the angular velocity vector is the sum of the moments, which is I G alpha. Bam. So here's your angular analogy for some of the forces is MA. Now let's be more clear here. Angular analogy for the linear momentum vector time derivative equal to sum of the forces equal to mass times acceleration. This is the angular analogy for that linear equation, which you've used quite a bit in the past, right? So some of the moments is IG alpha. Some of the forces is mass times acceleration. All right, math. We can take our math pants off now. Okay, no, just kidding. Don't do that. We still got math to do. All right. <clears throat> so we've got these equations. Great. Let's define some of these things just so we're all on the same page. This HG is the angular. Sorry, let's be clear about this. It's the time derivative. of angular momentum of rigid body about its mass center, which we know is that G. Oh, handwriting, God. Mass center at G. All right, we know this is the sum of moments acting on object. Okay, this is um, something that you're seen in the past. You've done moments in statics. Uh, you probably didn't do a lot of moments in 2002, but hopefully uh, I'm assuming you're comfortable at this point with uh, moments and sort of what those are. IG. It's the Instagram. No, just kidding. This is mass moment of inertia of rigid body about its mass center. Handwriting, I just, I thought it was gonna get better over time. It's seemingly getting worse over time. Apologies. I'm better on the whiteboard in real life. 
I don't know. I just can't handle this writing pad, I guess. But hopefully it's still legible. All right. IG, mass moment of inertia of rigid body about its mass center. And finally, alpha should know this at this point. This is the angular acceleration vector of our rigid body. Remember, if we have the angular acceleration of any point on a rigid body, then we know the angular acceleration of every point on the rigid body. That's kind of how this works. All right, so these are all our terms, and this is what's happening with this particular equation up here. All right, great, fantastic, wonderful. We did a bunch of math, now we have these equations, so what? So uh, how do we use them? All right, well, I wanna give one final warning about this particular equation uh, before we talk about exactly how to use this. And that last warning is, that the equation, sum of the moments, is IG alpha, is only valid at the mass center. Okay, I write this here, I put a box on this, but I promise people will try to apply this equation at points that are not the mass center. So this is big. This guy gets sparkles. He's important. Okay. So if you got another pen that you're writing with and you want to make sparkles on it, or if you're Michael Gorgeous and you're taking notes on an iPad like me, you can change the color and put some sparkles on it. Okay. Okay. All right. So that particular equation only valid at the mass center. And that's because we derived it um, with the assumption that we were at the mass center that wasn't moving. Okay. So, this is only valid at the mass center. There are some reasons for that that I don't want to get into right now, but just know that this is the case, all right? So what does that mean for our analysis? Well, that means for our analysis that we more or less need to get or gather all of the forces, all of the moments, all of the accelerations to the mass center, then do our analysis there. So my advice, is gather all forces, moments, and accelerations at the mass center before analysis. Okay, so no social distancing for these forces and moments. They all go at the center. We're putting them all there. They're all getting infected. They're all getting whatever each other's got. All right, gather them all there, then do your analysis. All right, the anti-social distancing for forces and moments. Okay. Um, now, how do we use this in application? So we've got these two equations now. That's fantastic. Let's talk about how we actually use this in application. So using this in application, when you did kinetics in ME 2002, you should have talked about a free body diagram and its relation to a kinetic diagram. So I sort of had mixed results in the last class. I, I want to kind of like pull the audience really quick. Uh, is the vector sign above the summation is or it's supposed to be over the M? Oh, I don't know where you're talking about. Um, I think I might have missed your comment, Mika, I'm sorry. Um, so here, uh, the vector sign should be over the M because moment is a vector quantity, if that's what you're talking about. Hopefully that's what you're talking about. Did I write it over the summation somewhere? Oh, God. Yeah, embarrassing. So here, yeah, there's no vector for the summation. Yep, should be over the M. Thank you. That's probably what you were talking about. Good catch. All right, time to poll the audience. How many of you have seen kinetic diagrams in 2002? If you have seen it, type yes. If you have not seen it, type no. If you're unsure, say suspicious, okay? I just, I'm curious because it, I had really mixed results from the previous class and I wanna see how, um, how you guys feel. David says suspicious. All right, so probably saw it, but it's probably in the way back of your memory. 
I just kind of need to know how much I need to discuss uh, kinetic diagrams. No, 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 suspicious. Okay, well, let's talk about kinetic diagrams then. Um, yeah, it was like 50-50 in the last class, so um, talk about it. All right, Caleb says not sure. So that means probably not. Suspicious. Great spelling there, Lucas. Love it. All right, using this in application. So in 2002, you should have seen kinetic diagrams. Oh, God. Kinetic diagrams. All right. And kinetic diagrams are useful for us to draw kinetic things that are happening on our body. So uh, typically you would draw a free body diagram and you would draw a kinetic diagram and then you would equate them to solve the problem. So the idea here is that if you're doing something like some of the forces equals mass times acceleration, the left hand side here gets the free body diagram and the right hand side here gets the kinetic diagram. All right. So a very common example and one that's sort of easy to understand and see is pushing a box along the ground with friction. So let's look at an example. And this is for a particle, um, which is sort of a box moving along the ground. So the model here, what we're doing here is we're getting, we've got a box or a crate or whatever the case may be, it looks like this, and it's uh, resting on the ground. So here is the ground, all right? And we're gonna apply some force to this guy here. So there's some force being applied to this particular guy. And let's say that this crate has a mass of M, all right? Well, your free body diagram in kinetic diagrams would be modeling this particular box as a particle by showing the forces and the accelerations that result on this particular box. So if you wanted to look at the free body diagram for this box, you would separate that box from the ground and talk about the forces that were acting on this particular guy. So in this situation, we'd have like here a force that was applied externally, F. You'd have here your weight of this particular box. You'd have a normal force that is pushing back on this particular box from the ground. And because this thing is moving, you have a frictional force that opposes this particular motion, which if you wanted to be specific about this, is mu k times the normal force, where mu k is the coefficient kinetic friction. All right, so this is your free body diagram. It shows all the forces, including the internal forces of weight, which are acting on your particular body. And we're modeling this as a particle, meaning that we could condense all of the forces that we've drawn in this box down to one particular point, okay? So even though I've drawn a box, I could really represent this as one little point with all of these forces acting. All right, so that's my free body diagram. My kinetic diagram for this box would be one that sort of shows the accelerations of this particular piece. So the kinetic diagram of this box would be here is your center of mass at G. And the kinetic diagram would simply be showing the mass times the acceleration in this particular direction. Now, we don't have any acceleration in the Y for this box because we're assuming it's just translating sort of along the ground. So this would be your full kinetic diagram. And the idea here is that you would equate the free body diagram to the kinetic diagram to solve your problem. So equating these two guys is like some of the forces equals mass times acceleration, where some of the forces is your free body diagram and mass times acceleration. This is your kinetic diagram. So that's the general idea. You have this free body diagram, you have this kinetic diagram, you sort of put the individual components where they go, equate them, be on with your business. All right, so that's a particle example, but now we're gonna kick it up a notch like Emeril Lagasse, or my personal favorite, Gordon Ramsay. Um, and we're gonna go from what would be sort of this particle idea to a free body diagram for rigid bodies. So here's now maybe an example for uh, 
rigid body. And let's maybe think of a bike wheel. All right, so here's our rigid body example. So here on the ground again, and this time we've got a wheel. All right, no longer can we assume that this wheel is a particle. And that's because we're going to drive this wheel with a moment that is the torque that we, we apply to the center of this wheel as we drive the bicycle. Okay, so here's the axle riding through the center of the wheel. And let's say because we're pedaling this bicycle, we're going to apply a moment or a torque at this particular location that is M. All right, and this is the moment applied from, let's say, pedaling. Okay. I don't know if pedaling has one L or two. I think it's just one. I don't know. English is hard. All right. So we're pedaling. Uh, and this is a wheel that is sort of moving along the ground. Okay. So if we look at the free body diagram of this, here's our wheel. And the free body diagram, well, let's make the center of mass here. Here's our center of gravity of this particular piece. This is point G. Well, this wheel is going to have, again, some weight, W, associated with it. It's going to have this moment that's being applied at the center, M. It's going to have some normal force, which is being applied on it from the ground. And it's going to have some frictional force that's uh, driving it. All right, so we have to have some sort of horizontal force uh, that's pushing this guy uh, along as we go. So we've got some force from the ground. Let's just call it. F, F. All right, so here's our frictional force. All right, so that's our free body diagram. We've got weight, we've got an applied moment, frictional force, normal force, so on and so forth. All right, this is going to be equal to what now is the kinetic diagram for this piece, which contains not only the linear acceleration of this guy at the center of gravity, which you're all probably used to seeing. So this bike is sort of moving to the right, and it has some mass times acceleration. Here, this is specifically in the x direction, so we might say max. We could take it to the max. And also, this wheel is spinning. So because of the spinning of the wheel, there's angular acceleration of the wheel, and the wheel has a certain mass moment of inertia, which is ig alpha. So this thing will also have an angular acceleration and an associated mass moment of inertia about the center, which is ig alpha. All right. In this particular case, we know alpha to be out of the page because we're sort of rotating this spike wheel in the page, but that's my kinetic diagram. And notice now that we've incorporated or basically have the same idea where we're equating these two things and we have for ourselves a series of equations, which is like the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration which is really in two dimensions, two equations. Some of the forces in X is MAX, and some of the forces in Y is MAY. All right, these are components, so no vector. So this is two dimensions, and we also have some of the moments is IG alpha, or for us, we're kind of constricted to K. So here we would have the sum of the moments. Uh, in the k direction is ig alpha, where this is strictly sort of in like the k. All right. So if we're in two dimensions, we have these three equations, some of the forces x, some of the forces y, and some of the moments about k um, that we can sort of work with now. All right. So this is sort of how we're going to utilize this uh, in application in this particular class. All right. Now, there are some kind of complications that can come about with rigid bodies. And that's because a lot of times we may have to take information that we know about one point of the rigid body and relocate it to the center of gravity because we always do our analysis about the center of gravity, right? It's the only place where that sum of the moments is IG alpha can be applied, right? So again, we have to do something with, let's take a look at this bike example, all right? So in this example, we'd have to do something like with this particular force. All right, so that force creates a moment about point G by this like moment arm here, okay? So you would have to sort of account for the moment that that guy creates by relocating that force to the center of gravity. And 
accounting for the moment that that particular force generates. All right, so we have to relocate all of our forces, all our moments to the center of gravity, then do our analysis there. OK, so I want to sort of spell this out very explicitly and give you guys sort of like a, uh, a process for solving these problems and talk about relocating forces and moments appropriately and sort of give you a little bit of refresher on relocating forces and moments that you might have sort of forgot about from your statics class. All right, so let's talk about like a typical strategy for analysis. All right. All right, first thing you want to do anytime you see these problems is create a free body diagram. All right, so let's draw a free body diagram uh, of the rigid body with all forces and moments. All right, you may need to apply uh some forces and moments to accommodate boundary conditions which you may remove from the system to create your free body diagram what i mean by that is remember back to your statics days when let's say you had a rigid body connected to a pin you had to account for the two reaction forces at that pin which might be a force in the x and the force in the y if you had an object that was cantilevered into a wall you had to account for the force in the X, the force in the Y, and also the moment that that cantilever can hold. OK, so don't forget. Boundary conditions. Which might be something like a pin or a cantilever. Or a roller etc all right so if you need a refresher from your statics class on how many reaction forces a roller gives you okay it's one or how many reaction forces a pin gets you okay it's two uh, maybe go back in and review that okay so if you're looking to create a free body diagram and you have to cut away some of these boundary conditions don't forget about that all right second what we're going to do is we want to relocate all the forces and moments to the center of gravity And I'll give you a quick refresher on how we do that if you sort of uh, forgot how to do that uh, in statics. So um, review, oh boy. If you have some rigid body, here's our world famous mechanics potato. Here's the center of gravity G. Here's some point that exists out in space A. And let's say you have here some force at A that exists, and you have a position vector here that locates A from G. All right. We need to relocate that force to the center of gravity so that we can do our analysis. Remember, analysis at the center of gravity must be. All right. So if we want to do that, we can do that by looking at our rigid body and relocating that force to the center of gravity all right so here's the relocation and here's this fa still sort of basically has the same magnitude and direction but now we have to accommodate the relocation of that force to the center of gravity by introducing a moment at that location as well which here would be rag cross fa so i might have a moment that's generated that looks something like this where I call this the moment generated from the relocation of A, where this moment is this position vector R arriving at A from O crossed with the force at A. So this is sort of a little statics review for you. All right, so this is relocating a force to a particular location to generate a force in a moment at that particular location. So again, analysis at the center of gravity for the love of the Lord, please. Analysis, center of gravity. All right. Next, you'll want your kinetic diagram. Okay. 
Okay. When you're doing your kinetic diagram, you may need to relocate accelerations to the center of gravity. Okay. Relocating to center of gravity. All right. And how do we relocate accelerations from one point on a body to another point on a body? You guys just did that on your exam, okay? So you might need, let's say you know the acceleration at one point on a rigid body, and you need to determine what the acceleration is at the center of gravity, because that's where we do our analysis. So you might need to relocate or calculate what the acceleration is at the center of gravity with our relative acceleration equations which is, let's say I know the acceleration of some point, the acceleration of A, plus, this should look familiar, alpha cross our position vector, locating uh, G from A, plus the angular velocity crossed with our angular velocity, crossed with the position vector, locating G from A. Yeah, you thought those equations were going away after your exam one? Incorrect. They are back and better than ever. All right. So you might need this acceleration equation to relate acceleration on another point of the rigid body to the center of gravity so that we can determine or create our kinetic diagram where our accelerations are centered at that center of gravity or center of mass. All right. So you might need this particular equation to do that. All right. All right. Now. We're going to equate our rigid or our kinetic diagram with our free body diagram. So equate free body diagram with Kevin Durant. No, just kidding. With your uh, kinetic diagram at center of gravity. I cannot say this enough. All right. Using the equations we just talked about, which is the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And sum of the moments is I G alpha. All right, so these are the two equations that we've talked about. This is our linear Newton's second law and our angular Newton's second law. Right. After we do that analysis or after we pull those equations together, we may need to redistribute information that we learned with those equations to other points of the body. All right, so relate what uh, I'll say this is if needed, because you don't always need to do this. Uh, we can relate what we learned in step four to other parts of the body. Okay, that again might be uh, using your relative acceleration equations or relocating forces that you calculated at G to different parts of the body using like R cross F equals M, those sorts of things. Okay, so re-relating things that you've determined at the center of gravity after your analysis, now dispersing that information to other parts of the body. All right, and so after all that, you may need to still solve for any remaining unknowns. All right, so hopefully I'm sort of like <laughs> drilling this idea home that you need to gather all of your components at the center of gravity, then do your analysis, and then disperse that information to the rest of the body if required, okay? So uh, that's it for today. Just a reminder, uh, I'll just say, actually, we're going to employ this strategy tomorrow. I'm going to do two example problems tomorrow in class. And also, I'll do some additional examples on Friday in class. Um, Friday is a holiday, so if you're not there, no big deal. Please try to take a look at uh, simulation number one. Um, the sooner that you can attack it, the better, because if you run into problems, uh, the sooner I can help you, the better. All right. So uh, thank you for coming today. I uh, hope we all enjoyed the mathy day. 
uh, kind of a lot of talking today, but we'll actually dive in on some um, some real stuff uh, tomorrow. So thanks for coming. Ta-ta.